and I just wanted to hand over to both of you at some point to give an idea, not of your loves, but of your present hates. Mm. Perhaps Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> Hate. I first heard of Jordan Peterson in 2017 when a conservative educator I knew said I should watch him on YouTube. Later, this educator, a history teacher, informed me that since Peterson told the truth, the left couldn't stand him. He also said Hitler did great things for his people. In retrospect, that he would praise and defend Peterson and Hitler seems fitting. In any event, I did watch Peterson, and within two minutes I realized he exhibited characteristics of the authoritarian personality. He angrily insisted, about gender inequality, that he was right, and an audience member who challenged him was wrong. His view was buttressed by incontrovertible facts, he said, before admonishing his challenger for being ignorant of the literature. As professors should know, the literature in any field of social sciences is vast, and there can be as many views as there are researchers and participants. Also, nothing is incontrovertible, and where did Peterson get his facts? In whose interest were these facts? And what modern-day educator would claim, with a straight face, to be the repository of facts, and therefore truth? But then, what professor would signal an end to a debate by shouting, And that's that! He's a fascist, I thought, and then discovered he was from Alberta, hardly Canada's most progressive province. Peterson has proudly compared it to Texas, and it's produced an inordinate number of populists, far-right nutters, and neo-Nazis. Anyway, why did Peterson upbraid his challenger with a disdain bordering on contempt? And why did he speak as though he were having a panic attack or about to fly into a rage? Again, in just a couple of minutes, I thought that something was very, very wrong, but didn't know what. Over the next six months, I tried to find out. I watched about 600 hours of Peterson's videos and filled five or six notebooks with scribbles. However, I discovered nothing of substance linking him to the far right. True, he repeatedly spoke like an authoritarian and occasionally mentioned Hitler in passing, but not in ways that were too concerning. I did wonder why he described a scene from the movie The Boys from Brazil without mentioning that it was about Joseph Mengele, the SS officer and physician at Auschwitz who was dubbed the Angel of Death but mostly I discovered characteristics that were connected to fascism, but not necessarily fascistic. For example, I learned that Peterson routinely lied, lacked empathy, and was a victimizer who, when criticized, played the victim. Put another way, I worked out that he was a narcissist. I also discovered that he despised women and fairness, and that he was creepy and freakishly weird. Moreover, his speech was sometimes incomprehensible, I would play bits of his lectures again and again and have no idea what he was talking about. At times it was like listening to a foreign language, and I have a background in linguistics. I became convinced that Peterson was a closet fascist, or possibly, just maybe, a neo-Nazi. But after six months, I had almost no proof. Peterson told interviewers that the reprehensible radical left was hunting for the smoking gun, but they hadn't found it because it didn't exist. However, he said this in such a state of agitation that it implied it did exist. Plus, he said that if they did find it, which they wouldn't, his career would be over. I hadn't found any smoking gun, and this made me feel depressed. I had done six months of research, which yielded next to nothing. While telling myself I needed to give up and double down on teaching, I was responsible for 150 university students at the time, I listened to a debate between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris that was moderated by Douglas Murray, who has said nice things about Viktor Orban and complained about white Britons having their culture destroyed by non-European immigrants. The debate was soporific, with Peterson defending religion and Harris criticizing it. After two hours, I was upset with myself for wasting more time by listening to it. But then, just as I was about to switch off my phone, I discovered the smoking gun. Peterson said, through the medium of his odd and sometimes opaque language, that he hated knowing he could work at Auschwitz with happiness a subject he had ruminated on for 30 years. This was not confirmation he was a neo-Nazi, that came later, but that he was a psychopath who would enjoy facilitating the oppression and murder of innocents. I thought of his clandestine reference to the film about Mengele, and then googled Peterson Hitler and Peterson Nazis. Incredibly, I had not noticed that he lectured on Hitler, let alone praised and defended him. 
But then I realized that millions of people had seen him praising and defending Hitler, but apparently hadn't said anything about it, or at least online. Before I tell you the rest of the story, here's the video that helped lead to my discovery that Jordan Peterson really was a neo-Nazi. Well, they had no mechanism by which to record their observations. Now, yeah, and I'm going to interrupt you. Yes. Because first of all, I saw a sign saying five minutes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm very conscious of a number of things, apart from my own silence. <laughs> and the, 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 the main one is this. We had a long uh, uh, session on love just then, and I refused to finish this evening on such a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to turn that round. We're all um, uh, uh, in agreement on certain aspects, free speech, civilized discourse on the most important matters, and much more. But there's also, I'm sure, a lot we have in common of what we just can't bear. And I just wanted to hand over to both of you at some point to give an idea, not of your loves, but of your present hates. Mm. Perhaps Jordan. Yeah. Hate. Well, I would say that I spent a lot of time over the last 30 years trying to understand the part of me that could be deeply satisfied as an Auschwitz prison guard. And I would say that that part is something that's worthy of hate. And I think the best way to overcome it is to recognize it in yourself and to do everything possible to constrain it. And that's what's given me an overwhelming horror, both of the nihilistic void and the catastrophes of totalitarianism. And the reason that I've turned to the degree that I have to the analysis of religious traditions not losing my scientific perspective in the meantime is because I've done everything I could to to extract out the wisdom necessary to understand how to deal with that bit of unredeemed evil that every bit of us possess. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would say that I hate unnecessary suffering, I, and, and especially my capacity for it. And, and I see so much of my time, you know, conscious time, moment to moment, devoted to uh, this experience that should be familiar to all of you, which is to be captured by thoughts of the past or the future, which are, uh, which almost by definition have a, 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 a mediocrity so transcendent that it's just, it, 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 it is what makes human life just, uh, just pure monotony and pettiness and, and everything that religion advertises itself as a corrective to, right? So I mean, what I'm sensitive to is that someone like Sayyid Qutub, when he came to, to uh, this is Osama bin Laden's favorite philosopher, uh, when he came to America in the, in the 50s, he saw his hosts and their neighbors spending all their time you know, bragging about how well mowed their lawns were and, and what, just what new you know, Chevrolets they had purchased. And he looked at all of this as just, it was just the quintessence of, of desecration and lost opportunity and the lack of profundity and for, for which, for him, the, the corrective, obviously, was Islam. And half of that is right. It's possible to be totally captivated by the wrong things in this life. And to make yourself not... So, obviously, being a guard at Auschwitz with a clear conscience is the extreme, the, the extreme case of that. I was thinking more of happiness. What was that? 
or being a guard at Auschwitz with happiness. Yes, okay, yeah, even worse still, right? So that's the extreme case. And to, and to realize that that is, that, that that job was not only filled by psychopaths, right? That, that psychologically normal people could, could be brought to that point. That's, yeah, I, I recognize that that's the situation we're in. But most of us live our lives in a different place where it's just mediocrity and pettiness and, and, and needless anxiety. And very dimly, we recognize the possibility of overcoming that on a day-to-day -day basis. I would say that I spent a lot of time over the last 30 years trying to understand the part of me that could be deeply satisfied as an Auschwitz prison guard, Peterson said. And I would say that that part of me is worthy of hate. I ask you, who would be deeply satisfied working as an Auschwitz prison guard, and who would meditate on the subject for three decades, although, as you will learn, it was more than four. Even the officers who made the selections at the railhead would often steady their nerves with a few drinks. But not JP. He could have made those selections sober and feeling deeply satisfied. After making this unsettling confession, Peterson went from positioning himself as a murder-minded psychopath to positioning the audience as murder-minded psychopaths, saying, and I think the best way to overcome it is to recognize it in yourself, and to do everything possible to constrain it. And that's what's given me an overwhelming horror both of the nihilistic void and the catastrophes of totalitarianism. The catastrophes of totalitarianism is probably code for the collapse of the Third Reich. Hitler repeatedly called Germany's defeat in World War I a catastrophe. And as I illustrate in The Devil and His Due, how Jordan Peterson plagiarizes Adolf Hitler, Peterson mimics dozens of Hitler's catastrophe quotes. The horror of the nihilistic void is a reference to liberalism, which, for the benefit of Peterson's untutored followers, he equates to nihilism and communism. Ask yourself, how could Peterson's decades-long fixation with his apparent dream job cause him to fear liberalism? It was the liberalism of the Western democracies that opposed Hitler and helped put Nazi camp guards out of commission. And the reasons I've turned to the degree where I have, he continued, to the analysis of religious traditions, not losing my scientific perspective in the meantime, is because I've done everything I could to extract out the wisdom necessary to understand how to deal with that bit of unredeemed evil that every bit of us possess. Not the unredeemed evil that each of us possesses, but the unredeemed evil that every bit of us possess. It's not that he misspoke, it's that he's invented his own language, hence why, originally, I couldn't understand what he was saying. The word possess signifies his belief that he's satanically possessed, and when he said evil possesses every bit of us, he meant it possesses each of what he has referred to as subpersonalities, subsystems, spirits, and avatars, which get you in their grip and fight for dominance in your mind. Only it's not your mind, at least I hope, but his. And then you have people with Tourette's syndrome, you know, that they'll be doing all sorts of weird dances and, and spouting off obscenities and, 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 and imitating people without being able to control it. And, and sometimes a little bit of antipsychotic medication can dampen that down, but it's as if there are these autonomous semi-spirits inside of them that grip control over their behavior and make them do things. And, you know, you find that to some degree in your own life. Peterson's narcissism helps ensure that even when it appears he's describing others, he's really describing himself. When he talks about spirits and mysterious forces which shuttle people about, he's revealing that he has schizophrenia or dissociative identity disorder. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia in a Toronto hospital by a team of physicians in January 2020, just before he went to Russia and Serbia to wean himself off benzodiazepines, which are prescribed for schizophrenia. When Peterson resurfaced in an interview with his daughter, Michaela, he recounted how he'd suffered from extreme akathisia, an agonizing jitteriness in the extremities, usually the legs, that makes it impossible to remain still. Akathisia is a neuropsychiatric syndrome often experienced by schizophrenics. According to the Cleveland Clinic, 24% of people diagnosed with and taking medication for schizophrenia have chronic akathisia. Getting back to satanic possession, a belief among schizophrenics is that they are the devil or possessed by the devil. Peterson has written about satanic possession regarding a schizophrenic patient who wanted to blow up the world and is forever fitting the Dark Lord into his talks, including ones about Pinocchio. He's a marionette with a benevolent puppeteer, but as soon as he develops some autonomy, then he becomes prey to forces that are 
elements of the demonic archetype, in fact, the worst bad guy in the entire movie turns into Satan himself at one point in the movie. He basically has horns and a bright red face and he manifests himself as so terrifying that the coyote... Coyote? Anyway, after Jordan Peterson said that participating in genocide could give him satisfaction, Sam Harris wandered off before dimly realizing what Peterson had said. And to make yourself not... So, obviously, being a guard at Auschwitz with a clear conscience is the extreme, uh, the, the extreme case of that. I was thinking more of happiness. What was that? More being a guard at Auschwitz with happiness. Yes, okay, yeah, even worse still, right? So, Sam's foray into the wilderness and his assumption about what Peterson meant indicate that, like so many people, he doesn't get it. Peterson wasn't identifying as a death camp guard who'd be unperturbed by his job, but who would delight in it. Knowing Peterson like I do, I doubt his saying that he could have worked at Auschwitz with happiness and feeling deeply satisfied was original. I believe the descriptors came from a book about Joseph Mengele, the sadistic doctor who Peterson once referred to as Mengali, and surreptitiously alluded to when he spoke about the boys from Brazil. I also suspect he mispronounced Mengele's name to distance himself from one of his heroes. When he discusses Nazism, he sometimes pretends not to be aware of key information that he has provided on previous occasions. Moving on, here's Peterson describing Mengele in a video he called Ordinary Men, Psychopaths, and Hitler. He's talking about the book Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning, about Unit 101 of Hitler's Order Police, whose commander, Wilhelm Trapp, he has praised and defended. Trapp was executed for war crimes after overseeing the deaths of some 83,000 Jews. You know, so lots of times it was ordinary men who went down the bad path one step at a time. And sometimes it was like people who were rotten to the core, like their minister of propaganda or mm -hmm. Mengali, the doctor. I mean, you know, he was a sadistic psychopath of the highest order. So Peterson has spoken about and alluded to Mengele asked his followers whether Nazi medical experiments, which Mengele performed, were criminal or not, and wrote in Twelve Rules for Life that he had read more than his fair share of dark books about Nazi Germany, so it's certainly possible he's read about Mengele. In Mengele, The Complete Story, by Gerald L. Posner and John Ware, there's a part where one of Mengele's underlings describes how when Mengele spotted a woman named Ebi who had escaped gas chamber selection, he flew into a rage. You still here? Dr. Mengele left the head of the column and with a few easy strides caught up with her. He grabbed her by the neck and proceeded to beat her head to a bloody pulp. He hit her, slapped her, boxed her, always her head, screaming, You want to escape, don't you? You can't escape now. You're going to burn like the others. You're going to croak, you dirty Jew. And he went on hitting the poor, unprotected head. As I watched, I saw her two beautiful, intelligent eyes disappear under a layer of blood. Her ears weren't there anymore. Maybe he had torn them off, and in a few seconds, her straight, pointed nose was a flat, bleeding mass. Dr. Mengele had stopped hitting her, but instead of a human head, Ebi's tall, thin body carried a round, blood-red object on its bony shoulders. Half an hour later, Dr. Mengele returned to the hospital. He took a piece of soap out of his bag and, whistling gaily with a smile of deep satisfaction on his face, he began to wash his hands. Mengele was whistling gaily with a smile of deep satisfaction on his face, and Peterson implied that he could have done such things at the same facility, with happiness and feeling deeply satisfied. Again, I suspect his word choice is a tribute to Mengele, in part because when he talks about the Nazis, he tends to orally plagiarize them. For instance, he has said that Unit 101 of the Order Police had to maintain order, and that they performed their duties because they had an esprit de corps, and Hitler said his forces needed to maintain order and required an esprit de corps. Peterson has also described himself in a manner similar to how witnesses described Mengele. On the Joe Rogan experience, Peterson said, It's easy to envision myself taking someone who just got off a transport train and have them carry a 100-pound sack of wet salt from one side of the compound to the other. People don't like to picture themselves doing that because it's too frightening but I know perfectly well that I could do that sort of thing, and maybe I could even enjoy it. And in Mengele, The Complete Story, a witness recounts Mengele performing his duties at the Auschwitz railhead. Day after day, he was at his post, watching the pitiful crowd of men, women, and children go struggling past, all in the last stages of exhaustion from the inhuman journey in the cattle trucks. He would point with his cane to each person and direct them with one word, right, to be worked to death, 
or left to be gassed. He seemed to enjoy this grisly task. Mengele seemed to enjoy it, and Peterson could enjoy it. Something else. Mengele sometimes performed his medical experiments in an underground lab. Reportedly, he ordered hundreds of children to be shot through the back of the head so he could dissect them. He amputated children's limbs. He dissected a one-year-old while still alive. All procedures were performed without anesthetic. And he injected dye into children's eyes, after which he ordered them to be gassed. Here's one of Mengele's assistants describing his dissection lab. Here, in this man-made hell, within these blood-stained walls, Dr. Mengele sat hunched for hours at a time poring over his microscope. And here's Dr. Peterson in 12 Rules for Life. Understanding my own capacity to act like a Nazi prison guard, or Gulag Archipelago trustee, or torturer of children in a dungeon, I grasped what it meant to take the sins of the world onto oneself. Each human being has an immense capacity for evil. Now we know that by Nazi prison guard, he means Auschwitz guard, and that he associates this job with torturing children in a dungeon, perhaps one with blood-stained walls. I should add that in Maps of Meaning, Peterson says he's been trying to understand his capacity for evil ever since he experienced a psychic split in his early 20s, whereupon he began hearing a chastising voice. In other words, ever since he descended into schizophrenia. But recalling how JP went from positioning himself as a Nazi to positioning the audience as Nazis, here he is saying how easy it is to get people to become Nazis. Well, I mean, when I, sp I spent a lot of time at the various universities I was associated with studying motivation for atrocity, because I was very curious about that as a psychologist, not, not as a sociologist or an econom economist or a political scientist. Uh, you're an Auschwitz guard. Okay, what's motivating you as an individual? And I wanted to understand it well enough so that I could understand how I could do that. Once more, note how he positions himself as a Nazi and the listener as a Nazi. We're the same, you and me. Just a couple of Auschwitz camp guards. What's motivating us? Nay, what's motivating us as individuals? What Peterson is forever telling his followers they need to be. Individuals who counter the collectivist left which is what Hitler told his adherents. Also, he just revealed, as he has on numerous occasions, that understanding the motivation for people to become Nazis and slaughter Jews underpins everything he does. All his books, speeches, lectures, interviews, and tweets. Again, when I point this out, no one says that Peterson must be insane, but that I must be. Indeed, if I surveyed 10,000 Peterson fans and 10,000 Peterson critics, asking them what subject lay at the heart of his belief system, I would be surprised if even one knew the answer. Here are some more questions for you. If Peterson spent his academic career trying to understand what motivates Nazis, why has he only done one lecture explicitly about Nazis? Why did he write his dissertation on potential psychological markers for the predisposition to alcoholism? And why does he spend so much time trying to motivate people who he has called rough working class men to hate women, kindergarten teachers, academics, members of the LGBTQ plus community, democratic politicians, journalists, the Canadian government, and anyone who dares criticize him. Peterson's detractors excel at ignoring evidence linking him to the Hitlerite faith, but seem incapable of spotting contradictions and asking critical questions that could help reveal who he really is. Because one answer to that is, well, that sort of behavior is so far beyond the pale that it's completely incomprehensible. It's just a manifestation of, say, like intense psychopathy and a normal person can't even imagine it. And I think, no, nah, that evidence doesn't really suggest that because it isn't obvious that all the people involved in the Nazi movement, for example, were criminally pathological, that they were deviations, like what would incomprehensible deviations from the norm. It'd be lovely to think that, and it would make the world a lot simpler, but I think the evidence mostly suggests that, no, you can get ordinary people to do that sort of thing, and maybe even to enjoy it. So his research question was, what motivates ordinary people, that is, ordinary men, to become Nazis and murder innocents? And presumably his findings sections focused on a single discovery, enjoyment. Unsaid was that he motivates his adherents like Hitler did, by claiming to want to help them by telling them they're being oppressed by the radical left, by instructing them to shun higher education, by informing them about a host of enemies they probably never even knew they had, by promoting religion and other forms of superstition, including occultism, and by acting as though he were their messiah. 
Indeed, someone has written a book about Peterson called Savage Messiah, How Dr. Jordan Peterson is Saving Western Civilization. The title is apposite. Hitler compared himself to Christ and claimed that he was saving civilization. And so that's pretty bloody terrifying. And so I tried to understand that, and I think I did to some degree, although we can't go into that. A fair bit of that's a consequence of envy. It's the spirit of Cain, I would say, if you had to sum it up in a phrase. But um, that isn't the issue. The issue is how do you stop it from happening again? And because that's supposed to be what we're concentrating on, let's say, in the aftermath of the Second World War. Never forget, which should mean something like, how about we don't do this again? And so my, my question was, well, how do, we, how do we best go about that, ensuring we don't walk down that road again? This is Peterson's out, and one of his patented techniques. He floats some insidious idea, and then says, but I wouldn't recommend doing it. However, the signal's already been sent. But circling back to Peterson saying, you're an Auschwitz guard, what's motivating you? Concerning the 2022 Freedom Convoy protests in Canada and the organizers' attempt to overthrow the government, Peterson said, From, you know, the swastika yeah. thing, it's like, really, just untrue. about Canadians? Really? We're going to be worried about Nazis in Canada? Because I had protests, for example, where people accused me of attracting Nazis. First of all, that just isn't a thing in Canada. There isn't a Nazi tradition. And I don't know anyone in Canada who's ever met anyone who's met someone who was Canadian who, and who was a Nazi. If Canada has no neo-Nazis, why would Peterson say, If you start to understand who you are, then you understand the Nazis. And who wants to understand the Nazis? You know, I can understand mm -hmm. sex criminals. I can understand them. Right. right. I can understand Nazis. And the reason for that is because I can see that as an aspect of myself, truly. So he could work as a Nazi at Auschwitz with happiness. He's been studying what motivates prospective Nazis to work at Auschwitz for 30 years. There are no neo-Nazis, at least in Canada. And Peterson, a Canadian, can see Nazi as an aspect of his personality, truly. He's also said that the lesson to be learned from the Holocaust is that the Nazi is you, he told a psychotic patient that she had to understand that the Nazis were her. He taught his psychology students at the U of T that, deep down, they were Nazis. He has said he doesn't like Nazis, he's not a Nazi, and up to five neo-Nazis, self-stated, contacted him looking to form a partnership. He's also said, no one wants to think they're a Nazi, but everybody is one. Furthermore, he has conceded that he has something in common with Nazis because, like them, he's opposed to the radical left. And he has told his followers that Hitler was brilliant, courageous, charismatic, a genius, a god, God the Father, the Great Father, the jovial father of the race, a master of speech, a master of dark fire, the devil, an evil god, a possessor of black magic, satanically possessed, akin to Lucifer, the knight of nationalism, the knight of the faith, the knight of the blood, and good at everything from painting to overseeing the rearmament of Germany, which facilitated the war that allowed for the Holocaust. Put another way, no one's a Nazi, everyone's a Nazi, Peterson's a Nazi, Peterson's not a Nazi, Hitler was horrible, and Hitler was wonderful. If you're wondering, what's with all the contradictions, I've identified three reasons. One, he's insane. Two, he's a pathological liar. Three, he's a neo-Nazi. Also, as stated, he's been thinking about being a Nazi camp guard with happiness for more than 30 years. I started studying the things that I have been talking about in, well, really as long back as I can remember. I think that's true. I wrote an essay when I was about 13 on, the, on Auschwitz. It wasn't a very good essay, but I was only 13, so it's not that surprising. But, and I don't know exactly why it was of particular concern to me, except that, of course, it's the sort of thing that should be of concern to everyone. So I said, when I was about 13, I, I wrote an essay on, on Auschwitz, and I, I was trying to understand it. Um, I think maybe I tried to understand it in a way that was somewhat different than most people who examine historical events because I was trying to understand how human beings could do that knowing 
full well that I was one of them. Peterson gave this talk in 2016 when he was 53. If he wrote the essay when he was 13, then he must have known in 2018, the year he debated Sam Harris, that he could have overseen the demise of Jews at Auschwitz with satisfaction for 42 years. And that's the critical thing, because generally when people examine especially something horrifying that's done by humanity, they make the assumption that it's other people doing it, and that's a, that's a big mistake in my estimation. Because if a lot of human beings have done something terrible, you can be sure that being a human being that you're capable of it. And, you know, one of the things that we've been asked repeatedly to do as a consequence of what happened in World War II is to not forget it. But it's always been my contention that you can't remember something you don't understand. I hate to say it, but on this point, one he's been making since at least 1996, I agree. It appears that people across the political spectrum do not understand how the Holocaust happened. For instance, how Hitler radicalized people to do his bidding. Indeed, most people seem to be unfamiliar with Hitler's speeches and rhetorical stratagems, and many consider reading him taboo. So when I say that Peterson is not only borrowing from Hitler, but plagiarizing him, people tell me I'm being absurd, forget that they've never read Hitler or Peterson. When Hitler spoke, he sometimes sounded like a necromancer, and so does Peterson, who camouflages his occultism by calling it mythology. Most people seem to have little to no idea about Hitler's interest in the occult or his esoteric oratory, let alone Peterson's, even though he's written and spoken explicitly about the occult, what he learned from it, and how it influenced the Nazis. Of course, people will deny that Peterson's mythology is occultism, but if his main interest is the Holocaust, why would he spend so much time talking about mythology? And why would he spend so much time talking about Christianity? These days, he's all about the Bible, which Hitler read, studied, and quoted to encourage German Christians to commit acts of evil. Furthermore, it does not appear to be widely understood that Hitler was a narcissist who channeled the bitterness and resentment of losers, citizens of a country who lost World War I and wouldn't accept it. And hardly anyone appears to have worked out that Peterson is a narcissist who channels the bitterness and resentment of other kinds of losers, such as the incels he recruits from the dark corners of the internet. Well, to be fair, Peterson's critics know about the incels, but not the narcissism. Peterson explains Hitler's role in radicalizing his followers, and then throws himself into a similar role, yet no one notices. He orally plagiarizes Hitler, for example when he talks about the need to establish order and eliminate chaos, yet no one bats an eyelash. He gives the Nazi salute while praising Hitler, raves about Nuremberg rallies, comes to the rescue of Nazi war criminals, flashes the white power hand sign, positions himself as a Nazi, and positions his listeners as Nazis, yet everyone flatlines, presumably because their understanding of fascism, Nazism, narcissism, and occultism ranges between poor and non-existent. As Peterson correctly says, you can't remember something you don't understand. You also can't recognize something you don't understand. And you don't understand what happened in Nazi Germany, or in the Soviet Union for that matter, until you understand that had you been there, the probability that you would have played a role and that it wouldn't have been a positive one is extraordinarily high. When people do think about themselves as actors in situations like that, they have a proclivity to cast themselves in a heroic role, assuming that had they been, say, in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, that they would have taken on the burden of fighting against the Nazis and defending the things that should have been defended. But that's a very foolish presupposition, especially because it's more or less self-evident from the historical perspective that that isn't what people did. And in order for us to come to terms with that, it means that we have to understand how it happened, but more importantly, what role we still play as individuals in acting in such a way that such things are not only likely, but desired. He means desired by people like him. 
As a history teacher, I've encouraged students to ask themselves what they would have done had they been a citizen of the Third Reich, reminding them that noncompliance wasn't exactly an option, and that although they may say they would have formed the resistance, it's impossible to know what one would really do under such circumstances. However, Peterson doesn't ask his listeners to consider what they would have done so much as tell them. What's more, he often speaks in the present or future tense, saying things like, you're a Nazi camp guard, what's motivating you? Or, as he told his psychotic patient, stop being a Nazi, don't do it anymore. During his debate with Sam Harris, he didn't speak about the part of him that could have been an Auschwitz prison guard, but the part that could be an Auschwitz prison guard, suggesting that there could be an Auschwitz-Birkenau too. And after he told his audience at the Ottawa Public Library that he had been thinking about the Holocaust since as long as he could remember, he said that leftists were murderous, the alt-right was incomplete, and merely discussing why privilege was racist and reprehensible. He also said that universities should not provide safe spaces. It's not a safe space, you know, in, in my classes, and I tell my students this right at the beginning. I'm trying to get them to understand why they are Nazis. Right, there isn't anything more unsafe than that. And all of them, virtually all of them, write back to me afterwards and say, uh, this was the most worthwhile class I've ever had in my life, and it changed my life. It's like, well, I'm teaching you the worst possible thing about yourself. And your response is, oh, that was so useful, and I'm way better than I was. You know, it's, it's, but it's in keeping with the idea that you need to be exposed to things that you fear and hate, because that's where salvation lies, roughly speaking. Apart from what students thanking Peterson for helping them realize they were Nazis says about the state of Canadian education, he tells them they were Nazis from day one. Welcome to psychology class. I'm Dr. Peterson and could work as an Auschwitz guard or torturer of children in a dungeon. And you are my new batch of Nazis. Note that down. You'll be thanking me by semester's end. Returning to the story of how I realized Peterson was a Nazi, after discovering his I could have helped kill Jews confessional, Along with his veneration for Hitler, I stalled for another six months before buying a copy of Mein Kampf to see if he had found it inspiring. What I discovered was wholesale academic theft. When I read Hitler, I thought, that's what Peterson said in Colorado. That's what he said in Ireland. This finding came as a complete shock. After finishing Mein Kampf, I read Twelve Rules for Life and found that it contained a lengthy quote from Mein Kampf, as well as heaps of plagiarism from that book. I hadn't stumbled on what some have dismissed as the natural overlap of language, but outright piracy. I went on to read Maps of Meaning, in which Peterson all but admits he has schizophrenia, along with Hitler's second book, Table Talk, and Speeches, and I uncovered some 3,100 examples of Peterson copying from Hitler. In addition, I traced Peterson's occult references to the writings of Aleister Crowley a Satanist who was obsessed with Adolf Hitler and bragged to prospective recruits that his books had influenced Mein Kampf, which wasn't true. I knew almost nothing about Aleister Crowley, including what he looked like, but I read two biographies and about ten of his books. Maps of Meaning is overflowing with clandestine Crowley references, often bound up in discussions about mythology, mysticism, Gnosticism, Eastern religion, Christianity, and alchemy. When I had documented about 200 instances of Peterson mimicking Hitler, and 20 of him aping Crowley, I now have over 500 Crowley examples, Vox Day published Jordanetics, in which he accused Peterson of being insane, possibly schizophrenic, like Hitler, and an occultist who was channeling Aleister Crowley. I had never heard of Vox Day, but was stunned to find that his conclusions about Peterson were similar to mine. When I mentioned Vox Day's book to liberals, I got admonished for platforming a member of the far right and harming the transgender community by failing to focus on the real issue, Peterson's anti-trans speech. When I told liberals about the book I published, a little over two years after discovering the plagiarism, they labeled me dishonest, crazy, and a fraud, which was how I had characterized Peterson. People also wanted to know why I'd read Mein Kampf, and like the conservative educator who suggested I watch Peterson, when I informed men that Peterson was filching from Hitler, they defended Peterson and Hitler. This happened about ten times, and I'm talking mostly about educators, men with university degrees. Online, I was informed that accusing someone of being a Nazi was out of bounds and had become meaningless. 
The reasoning was, since people casually branded others Nazis, you couldn't say anyone was a Nazi. I wondered if this were a case of the left repeating the propaganda of the far right. Here are two of Jordan Peterson's friends, Dave Rubin and Lauren Southern, talking about non-existent neo-Nazis. Be aware that Southern almost certainly is a neo-Nazi. I don't think that there are Nazis running around. Nazis were a political party in Germany in the 1930s. They're not really running around now. The problem that's happened is so many people uh, have, they've never read fascist literature. They've never studied any of the far right ideologies. They've just been told bigotry, 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 repeat bigotry. So they have no idea what they're talking about. So either they're, they, now they've gone in, they called everything Nazism, everything white supremacy. The word means nothing anymore. When the left says there are no Nazis, it emboldens people like Southern, who is stumped for neo-Nazis like Richard Spencer and said that Black Lives Matter was a terrorist organization. But getting back to left-wing unreason, after my book came out, I tried to explain that far from being some kind of con job, my claims were based in evidence. But this had zero impact. Obviously, I was just looking for attention or trying to make a buck. It occurred to me that the depictions of Peterson from the right were often rivaled in shallowness and juvenility by characterizations from the left. On the right, JP was a hero, strongman, a genius, and someone who could stand up and destroy the woke mob, especially female journalists. And on the left, he was a grifter, benzo addict, and purveyor of word salad who espoused nonsense on Twitter. What kind of leftists were these, I wondered, with their superficiality, dictums, arrogance? cheap memes, list of banned books, and anti-intellectualism. To be certain, people on the progressive side of the ledger have continued to denigrate me, who they don't know, and my book, which they've never read. Who knew that liberals could be so stupid? And it isn't just ordinary people who don't recognize that Peterson is the leader of a massive Hitlerite cult. It's the Young Turks, the David Pakman Show, the Majority Report with Sam Cedar, and the mainstream media. Self-pity out of the way, in the next clip you'll see Peterson talking to his followers from his upstairs office while sitting next to a painting of five people about to be executed. He's talking about how morality is cowardice, and one must learn to be harmful and dangerous by embracing the Jungian shadow, a concept Jung associated with Hitler and the devil. Watch as he explicitly encourages his listeners to channel their bitterness and resentment and understand that they are Nazi camp guards. Jung was very interested in phenomena such as, um, say, psychological, the psychological phenomena that would characterize the actions of someone who might be an Auschwitz camp guard, for example. And, uh, you know, that's a pretty monstrous form of behavior. And the thing about Auschwitz camp guards is that there's no reason to assume, really, that they were much different than normal people. Now, there would have been exceptions, obviously, but and what that means is that perhaps you too could be an Auschwitz camp guard and perhaps you would even derive some enjoyment out of it and you might think not, but you shouldn't think not so quickly. And what that also implies is that if you could see what that meant when you looked in the mirror and looked at yourself, you might run away screaming because you'd have a revelation of just exactly what the human being is capable of. And that's a very unpleasant revelation and also one of the things that stops people from being enlightened because that revelation of the evil of the self is part of the journey to enlightenment and an early part. One, note how he said that you'd have a revelation about Nazi camp guards. Remember that because later you'll hear him talking about schizophrenic revelations. And two, when he said that realizing you're a Nazi is a form of enlightenment, this was occultism. He means you'll be enlightened by the light of Lucifer. He often refers to Lucifer as the bringer of light. Peterson may have gotten the notion of satanic enlightenment from Aleister Crowley, who believed he'd been enlightened by and could communicate with the devil. There's two pathways to the development of the shadow, and they're tightly allied with one another. Um, the fundamental pathway is truth, and that's to face the bitter truth about yourself. But to break that down more particularly, you might think about that as the capacity to observe your own resentment. You're going to be resentful and bitter in many situations because you don't get what you want. And if you watch that resentment and bitterness, you'll see that it produces fantasies that can be unbelievably dark. And that can be very frightening. And you might not want to admit to yourself that you're actually capable of having fantasies like that or impulses of, of, like that or aggressive feelings like that. But the thing is, is that if those 
aggressive feelings and impulses and fantasies are integrated into your character. It's like you're opening up a dialogue with a part of yourself that can be very forceful and strong and dangerous. And it's really useful to be dangerous. Recognizing your evil is like opening up a dialogue with a part of yourself that's forceful, strong, and dangerous. Of interest here is part of yourself. Recall Peterson saying, I spent a lot of time over the last 30 years trying to understand the part of me that could be deeply satisfied as an Auschwitz prison guard. Again, he describes himself as having a part that's demonic and suggests to his audience that they have the same part. Narcissists want you to be like them. Anyways, you attend to your resentment honestly and you observe yourself and what you're actually like. You got to pay attention as if you don't know yourself, as if you might harbor hidden devils and then maybe they'll emerge. The devils are the spirits or subpersonalities that Peterson is always going on about. Maybe your devils will emerge. Hopefully they'll emerge so you can experience a revelation and comprehend that the dangerous Nazi camp guard who could help facilitate the eradication of Jewish men, women and children with happiness is you. Hitler called his realization that the Jews were the leaders of social democracy a revelation. And in Maps of Meaning, Peterson talks about revelation in association with Nietzsche's concern with race mixing. He writes, It is reasonable to presuppose that the idea of mixed races defeating non-mixed races in some kind of culture war was the unconscious consideration of the potentially positive outcome of such mixing that led Nietzsche to the revelation of the dawning future Superman. Peterson has written and spoken about Nietzsche's Superman in connection with Nazism. For example, by saying the Superman was a concept the Nazis really pulled off. And Nietzsche said that his Superman was the devil. Peterson wants his followers to become supermen, that is, devils. His revelation was probably inspired by the revelations of Hitler and Nietzsche. Oh, and schizophrenia. Listen to what he said to Richard Dawkins about schizophrenics having revelations and understand that he's talking about himself. Like, I think thought is usefully parceled out into a revelatory element and a dialogical element. And so the revelatory element is, while well, you're sitting there and thoughts enter the theater of your imagination. Yes, thoughts could be described as entering the field of your imagination, but Peterson is likely referring to schizophrenic thoughts. In Maps of Meaning, after all but admitting he suffers from schizophrenia, he says that schizophrenics have experiences where one's thoughts are being withdrawn from or inserted into one's head. Again, Peterson also says that his psyche split into two and he began hearing a voice. He then cites a paper on schizophrenia called Hearing Voices. And so it's in a, in a sense, phenomenologically, like they sort of spring up from the void. And you can be struck by a thought, which is really interesting, right? It's like, well, it's your thought. Why are you struck by it? Where does Where it, come it come from? from? Huh? Yes, that's it. No kidding. Where does it come from? Peterson would think it comes from the devil, or what he calls in Maps of Meaning his criticizing part. That is, the voice with the eyes that appeared in his mind and began chastising him whenever he spoke. He says his criticizing part helped him realize that he lied all the time, but that by telling the truth, and remember him equating telling the truth to admitting you're a Nazi, he could appease the criticizing part and eventually become the criticizing part. At the outside chance you haven't put it together, his criticizing part is the part of him that could happily work at Auschwitz. But then there's another element which is, well, not all intuitions are valid, the things that strike you, even though being struck is often a pretty good indication that there's something there, but it's not always an indication. And there are certain forms of psychopathology, schizophrenia in particular. Schizophrenia is characterized by the misfiring of that intuition system. So, for example, here, part, partly what happens to people who have um, like ideas of reference, they'll be watching television and the latent inhibition will get stripped away from their perception of the voices. And so now the voices become magnified in significance. And to account for the magnification of emotional significance, they start thinking, the television has a special message for me. It's like the receipt of a religious revelation, and it's often accompanied by religious ideation. So it's not that uncommon, although it's somewhat uncommon, for people who are floridly schizophrenic to identify with Christ. It's very like religious revelation. It actually, is very, it is, yeah. it is very like religious. I wanted to come to 
How would Peterson know that this form of psychosis was very like religious revelation? Because he experiences it. On the same page in Maps of Meaning that he discusses his split and the admonishing voice, he relays a dream he had about nuclear Armageddon. Therein, he writes about the television in his parents' basement, saying, The television picture and sound distorted, and static filled the screen. My cousin stood up and went behind the TV to check the electrical cord. She touched it and started convulsing and frothing at the mouth, frozen upright by intense current. Six lines earlier, he says, I could not escape from such dreams or ignore them. They centered, in general, around a single theme, that of nuclear war and total devastation, around the worst evils that I, or something in me, could imagine. The something in him was the voice with the eyes, that is, the devil. I know it may sound strange, but Jordan Peterson thinks he's possessed by the devil. You just heard him say that schizophrenics who have revelations may identify with Christ. This is true, but he failed to mention that they may also identify with the Antichrist. Inmates at Auschwitz may have wondered if Joseph Mengele identified with the Antichrist. One prisoner characterized his gaze as satanic, and Peterson, who has described the infamous work will make you free sign as satanic, is forever telling his listeners that, essentially, they could be like Mengele. Part of personality development is to understand your shadow. And the shadow is those things about you that you do not want to admit to. And you can learn about your shadow by reading history. You know, you can read about Auschwitz. You can read about the concentration camps in Russia. And you can imagine yourself as a guard instead of as a heroic rescuer of unfortunate victims, which would be very, very unlikely. And once you can imagine yourself as a guard, which is a terrifying thing to do, then you understand something about yourself. And I actually think, and I think this is also from student studying Jung, that you cannot have proper respect for yourself until you know that you're a monster. You can't have respect for yourself until you have a schizophrenic revelation that you're an Auschwitz guard who could murder Jews with happiness. My name is Troy Parfit. I'm the author of The Devil and His Do, How Jordan Peterson Plagiarizes Adolf Hitler. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe.